Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the program evaluation, par uh, particularly if you are a primary care provider, as uh, this presentation will help you meet the uh, IBME mandated uh, training and end of life uh, education uh, required for licensure. Uh, also, please remember to fill out the program evaluations and uh, give us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics and future speakers. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Larry Ottoman, who is our speaker. Uh, Dr. Ottoman is a member of the Department of Hematology and Oncology uh, at McFarland and MGMC. Uh, he has been a uh, generous and frequent uh, contributor to Grand Rounds, and in fact, I think he's given us some of our best Grand Rounds in the last few years. He's here to uh, discuss artificial hydration and nutrition at the end of life, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ottoman. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we'll see if I'm alive here. Is that coming through? Okay, good. So today's topic um, is going to be divided into uh, three parts. The uh, first part, where'd my little, oh, there it is. <clears throat> the first part uh, has to do with some of the science. Get this. Okay. That. Okay, good. The first part has to do with some of the science of uh, artificial hydration and nutrition. There's not very much, uh, and I'll go through that. But just to at least share with you what I've learned, the uh, second thing that I'll be discussing with you is uh, a little bit of the patho. The first thing will actually be a little bit of the pathophysiology of cachexia and uh, starvation, the difference between the two, because uh, certainly we hear all the time from uh, families, I don't want to let my mother starve, I don't want to let my father starve, and so on. So I thought I'd go through a little bit of the pathophysiology there. And then I would really uh, do hope to spend most of my time talking about this topic, which is how does one begin to engage families in discussions about artificial hydration and nutrition. Uh, and the bulk of the talk will be that. <clears throat> For those who can't stay the entire talk, and I'm sure there's almost nobody that that fits, uh, there are two handouts that will be available uh, at the end of the talk, about the middle of the talk, that I, I found very helpful and people are more than welcome to, to grab that. And I'll talk more about that at the end as we uh, discuss things. So let's go ahead and get started. I always like to start with a case history, it kind of personalizes things. Um, I think if you look through this, everyone in the room is going to say, oh yeah, been there. Uh, don't know necessarily done that, but certainly been there. So an older man with slowly advancing dementia, he's now nursing home bound for the last uh, five years. For the last two years, he can't even recognize uh, family members. And in the last two months, he's really ended, in, entered into the terminal phase of uh, dementia, which is he's uh, losing weight. The uh, nursing home administrator voices a concern that they may uh, be fined or dinged by the inspectors because they have this patient who's clearly failing to maintain nutrition and hydration. And uh, her request is that something be done, uh, particularly in the form of placement of a PEG tube. The patient, uh, like 90% of all of us, has never indicated or never indicated to his family before he became demented what his wishes were. So keep that case in mind. We're not going to go to it for a little bit, but uh, that kind of sets the tone. That's the kind of patient that we're going to be talking about, and that's the kind of patient uh, that we've all had experience with. Just to talk a little bit about uh, the science of, uh, of cachexia, uh, the first thing that you do is you define it. So uh, it's taken years. There was actually an international meeting uh, that set about just to define what these entities were. And they chose a three-part uh, definition. The first one is uh, people who are not yet cachectic, but they're starting to lose weight, but only about 5%. Uh, 
they're not as hungry, there are some metabolic things that you can measure, and then uh, people fit the criteria for cachexia. And I think that uh, in addition to the weight loss, our understanding of the pathophysiology of cachexia uh, hinges a great deal on what is a really embarrassing typo for Lancet, but there you are. It's not uh, systemic inflation, but systemic inflammation. Uh, but uh, I, I couldn't help but put the slide up and make fun of them. So, And then finally, uh, people go into the last phase. Uh, the, the classic one is a patient with an advancing malignancy, not responding to treatment any longer, what they would call a refractory uh, cachexia. Uh, performance score is very low. If people know performance scores, the higher your number, the worse you are. Uh, five is death. And so uh, that's kind of the definition. This is from another textbook that uh, does get the spelling correct, and so <laughs> I put that in too. This is from the uh, Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care uh, Medicine. Uh, again, defined in this case as weight loss more than 10%, uh, a reduced, reduced caloric intake. So both of those, uh, losing weight, not eating enough, and this is the other component that people have really focused on with cachexia, and that is the idea that this is a chronic inflammatory condition, that it's not just not getting enough calories. This is very complicated, and the only reason I put it up there is to tell you this is very complicated. Uh, I won't bother going through all of the initials, but the point is, is that there is a constant crosstalk between solid organs, uh, the stomach to the brain. Uh, cancer has an impact on fat metabolism, muscle metabolism. It has an uh, impact on gluconeogenesis, which occurs within the liver. And uh, there is a lot of research that has gone on. Uh, and continues to go on, and I'll show you in a minute why that's important. <clears throat> this is a table taken from that Oxford uh, textbook on palliative care that just points out the differences between cachexia, the classic is cancer cachexia, but would also be true for any kind of chronic inflammatory disease, and starvation. And the, the relevant parts is that Protein breakdown is much, much more an element of cancer cachexia than is uh, starvation. This is an active process of breaking down proteins. Uh, and the other thing that I will mention is that uh, one of the problems is, is that the body's response to the loss of weight and loss of protein is impaired. So the growth hormone does not go up, and this is growth hormone growth hormone releasing uh, hormone. It's called GH, GH relin. And I'll mention in a second why that's important. Cortisols are oftentimes elevated, again, kind of a component of this chronic inflammatory state. I keep doing that. This is a very interesting trial that was just presented about six weeks ago at the European uh, Society for Medical Oncology. And uh, anamorelin is a mimetic or a similar molecule to the GH relin. And these were two well-conducted phase three studies. And you can read for yourself, they were in patients with incurable non-small cell lung cancer, almost 1,000 patients between Europe and the United States. That's why there's a Romana one and a Romana two. And what they saw in 12 weeks, which is the uh, cut off for the presentation at the ESMO was that there was in fact an improvement in lean body mass which means an improvement in muscle mass and that patients in fact did have an improvement in anorexia and cachexia. Now what everyone is waiting for and in fact the company is not even planning on applying to either the European or the American uh, drug approval agencies until they get out to about 12 months. What everyone wants to know is, will it make a difference in terms of how long these people survive? But I think that within the next year, uh, I expect that we're all going to hear about 
uh, this particular drug. Uh, it's made by a company called Helsin. I don't know if they're traded or not, so you'll have to look that up yourself. <clears throat> Let me go back to a little bit of this. So that's all the pathophysiology of starvation and cachexia I wanted to go through. Let me go through what little science there is uh, and start with a, a few facts. Dementia and enteral nutrition, uh, it's sort of uh, the non-malignant big issue. Uh, in 15 years ago, when data was collected, there were over 60,000 patients in American nursing homes that year who were being fed with peg tubes. So it's not uncommon. In studies that have been conducted so far, there has been no survival benefit ever demonstrated with peg tubes, with a 78% mortality at three months. Repeatedly, people have demonstrated that it does not prevent aspiration pneumonia, which is, even when I was in training, that was sort of the, uh, the folk wisdom that was passed along, that there's no difference in incidence of pneumonia, that there's no difference in the incidence of bed sores. If anything, bed sores are more common in patients that are being tube fed, and there's certainly no improvement in the patient's comfort or ability to function. So all of the things that families would want to be true in order to say, yes, we should do this to my mother or father, we have an obligation as providers to tell them it won't help. Now, that may run counter to wisdom or common sense, but the truth is, is that in all the studies that have been conducted, artificial feeding of demented patients with peg tubes uh, is not effective in any reaching any of the goals. And what was found, not surprisingly, is that we tend to overestimate the benefit when we discuss this with families, and we tend to underestimate the risks and the discomforts associated with it. There are only a few studies uh, that have demonstrated any change in weight, and it's all been water weight. Uh, there's no increase in muscle weight. If you don't use your muscles, you can put all the calories you want. We've all known that from TPN. If you don't use your muscles, you don't gain muscle. There was no change in the patient's cognition or ability to uh, uh, care for themselves. And as I said, it does not prevent aspiration pneumonia or prolong survival or reduce pressure sores or speed up the healing of bed sores that are already there. Uh, and it doesn't palliate the patient in any way. Side effects are easy to understand. You can still aspirate, obviously, if you fill the stomach. Um, there's a risk of an infection from the aspiration. There are, because of the forced fluid administration, there are more oral secretions that patients have to deal with. And obviously, you've put in a mechanical device, there are going to be more complications. Now, I, I want to also review the literature uh, with regards to patients who aren't being fed enterally. Uh, this all comes from the European uh, literature where they're much more willing to continue artificial feeding of patients. These were all patients who had uh, partial, bowel partial or complete bowel obstructions and when they analyzed those patients, there were quite a few of them, over 400, um, survival ranged anywhere from five months to 44, uh, excuse me, 5% to 44% surviving at six months. And the conclusion was, is that you can make an argument for artificially feeding patients with abdominal uh, carcinomatosis, that's this group of patients, uh, but it's a very select population. The uh, Swedes did a similar study. Again, this seems to be uh, at least reported on more commonly than in America. Um, they had over a thousand patients, only 94 of them, so it was, it was used very infrequently in a very selective manner, primarily with patients with GI or GYN malignancies. And in those patients that were so carefully selected, they were in their uh, 
subjective sense, they felt that those patients benefited. So I don't want to say that forced feeding is always the wrong thing to do. You can imagine a scenario in which artificial feeding intravenously may, be, uh, may improve a patient's quality of life, but it's a select few. This is a very interesting series of trials. Dr. Barrera is in charge of palliative care at MD Anderson, and this is one of the very, very few true randomized trials in this field of artificial hydration and nutrition. And it was a very, I thought, a very clever design. They're inpatient, so they're in his inpatient unit. Uh, and they blindly, blind to the patient, blind to the providers, administered either 100 or 1,000 ml of normal saline over four hours daily. And then they evaluated the patients. They came up with what was called a dehydration symptom score, which you can read for yourself. And there was significant improvement in the patients. But what was quite interesting is that the significant improvement was no different. So clearly, the patients got better because people paid attention to them, uh, were spending more time with them. You can make up lots of things, but it could not have been the fluid since that was blinded and they were so different. There was no difference in how long those patients survived. So in one of the few randomized trials, you can state definitively to families, no, they're not going to be better off if we give them IV fluids. This was the conclusion from their most recent paper, uh, and I'll let you read that. Uh, in part, it says, patients moderately to, mildly to moderately dehydrated within a few days to weeks of death, uh, artificial hydration, it offers no benefit, no improvement in symptoms, no improvement in quality of life, no improvement in survival. So it's not just uh, us saying, gee, I don't think this is going to help. There is some science. The Cochrane Reviews, uh, everyone is familiar with this agency that does on a regular basis random uh, reviews of all the trials. These are very recent reviews. Their conclusion in hydration is that in all the literature they reviewed, there were six studies. Three were randomized. One of them included Dr. Barrera's, which was the largest, in three prospective trials. Their conclusion was that it's of no benefit to artificially hydrate patients. In the nutritional arena, there has never been a randomized or even a controlled trial with regards to parental nutrition. A prospective trial is simply saying, we did this and we're reporting the results to you. And their conclusion was what I came away with from my review of the literature, and that is that there are a few patients who have a good performance status and have several months to live where it may be of some benefit. Uh, but it's a very select few. That's the science that I wanted to share with you, and I wanted to spend all the rest of my time talking a little bit more about the ethical and legal issues uh, and uh, then finishing with how to have a, a practical discussion. Um, I want to pay tribute to uh, a man that ran the biomedical ethics uh, department at the University of Iowa until his retirement. He also happened to be one of my professors at St. Olaf when I was there and, in fact, was instrumental in getting me interested in uh, medical ethics, Dr. Robert Weir. Um, he wrote a very good but not widely read book called The Abatement of Treatment, and he liked the term abatement because he thought it kind of emphasized the universal sense of what we're talking about. Either a treatment is deducted or omitted or subtracted from a range of options. It could also mean that the treatment is reduced in intensity. You're just not as aggressive or as intense. And it also suggests that there is uh, an autonomous or a free decision made to halt or refuse treatment. Um, as all ethicists like to do, they sort of laid out what are all the possibilities. And then he wrote, I thought, a very learned and uh, well-written 
discussion of the strengths and weaknesses. I won't go through all of that, but basically uh, you can either say that uh, you should never, ever, in any circumstance, stop uh, life-sustaining treatment, that you should never, ever do it if someone is not dying. The only, ex the only group that you can do that for are the patients that are actively dying that there may in fact be situations in which you can abate all forms of life-sustaining treatment when warranted. And admittedly, when warranted is very vague, and that's what a major part of his book is about. What would warrant that decision? You can also tip to the other side of the spectrum, which is that there in fact are exceptional cases in which intentionally ending someone's life is justified, or that not only is it justified, but it should be legal as well. And so those are the spectrums. I would guess, not surprisingly, the golden mean wins, that most people would typically fall in that middle group, as does uh, Dr. Weir in his writings. I want to review just a little bit the legal background to this whole issue of, of limiting or abating artificial hydration and nutrition. I've talked a little bit about this before, and I won't cover it in as much detail. Uh, the legal and ethical groundwork for this uh, comes about from a, a number of things which have been well established in both the legal and ethical world. <clears throat> that there in fact is a right to self-determination or autonomy. That this is a medical procedure, either hydration or nutrition, that requires an informed consent in which risks, benefits, and alternatives are discussed that there is a role for surrogate decision makers when patients can't speak for themselves. So just because a patient can't speak for themselves, we're not obligated to do other everything. Legally and ethically, we can call upon surrogates to help make the decisions. And that in both the legal and ethical world, there is generally thought to not be any difference between either withholding a treatment or withdrawing that treatment. This is sort of a historical review, which I thought was interesting, but the, the phrase no extraordinary means or no extraordinary burden uh, was first uh, uh, published by Pope Pius XII in 1957, not that long ago in terms of history of medicine, uh, in talking about uh, whether families were obligated to see to it that a family member received every treatment possible. It was interesting because the context of that discussion was simply people that lived in rural Italy, it was a tremendous burden for them to carry their parents to a major university to get care. And people would ask their priest, we, we just can't do this. Uh, are we obligated to? And that's what led to the, the ruling the uh, encyclical, I should say, that in the 1980s there became recognized this principle of autonomy and the right to refuse, right to refuse treatment. And then in 1993 there was uh, what oftentimes happens in this field, what becomes known as a Uniform Act. So this is the Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act in which uh, it was uh, proposed that artificial hydration and nutrition should be regarded first as a treatment that could be refused. And then through the 90s and into the early 2000s, we're seeing uh, an, a body of scientific evidence that tries to answer the question, is it of benefit? Now, why don't we just, you know, walk into the room and say to the family, no, nope, peg tubes don't help, end of discussion, that's it. Uh, you know, all of us realize that it's not anywhere near that easy. So let's think a little bit about why is it such a difficult decision. Um, and I think a lot of these things are gonna be uh, common sense to all of you. There's denial going on. Uh, and there is a perception that starvation, uh, which is the wrong term, is cruel in a painful process that no one had ever want their family member to go through. We don't know as much as we should know, or we don't apply what we know to the circumstance. Frankly, there is payment for a procedure. 
uh, uh, replacement of a peg tube. And uh, especially, I think, if you're a consultant who's called in to place a peg tube, you're assuming that the hospitalist or the primary care provider has already had the discussion with the patient and their family about the pros and cons. Uh, and so rather than launch into that again, uh, I think a lot of uh, proceduralists would say, okay, they asked me to do it, I'm gonna do it, and that's, that's it. I talked a little bit in that one scenario at the beginning, uh, and I wasn't as aware of this, and I must admit, if there's anyone from a nursing home administration position, I'd love to know if this is still the mindset, but apparently um, there is a big ding for nursing homes if patients are wasting away, uh, however natural it is. Uh, they also uh, get reimbursement for feedings, and it's not cheap to hand feed patients because it takes another human being with that hand to do it. And you can estimate in time studies that have been done that it takes about three times as long to hand feed a patient as it does to simply plug in the nutritional mixture for their peg tube. So there's an economic issue uh, as well as a, a manpower issue. This is all the image that we have, this, this is the image that we all have, I think, of patients who are wasting away. I thought this was really a, a, a moving. Let's talk a little bit about what that image means to us and what the impact is of this notion. This is a very nice editorial that was written by uh, Dr. Zitter, published just a short time ago in the New York Times. I'll let you read that for yourself. Food is how we know best to care for one another. It runs contrary to every impulse we have as a human being to stop feeding. Feeding is elemental uh, of necessity. What she hopes that people can come away with is this notion, and it was true, because this until there was artificial feeding, this is all one could do. We fed until they could take no more and knew that we had done everything that we could. And if we can leave with our families that notion instead of, well, we didn't agree to a feeding tube. You know, maybe we should have for mom. Um, this is Dr. Zitter's wish, is that when people get to that point, that this is the conclusion they come to. We've done everything that we could and could do no more. This is a popular picture, and I think it summarizes what does food mean to all of us? It's a pretty simple equation. Food equals love in all of our households, as it has been uh, forever. And there are all sorts of topics that get tied up into this business of people not eating, losing weight. There are the hopes and the fears that people and families have. There is the physical distress there's the distress on the family member who sees someone like the statue. People are already beginning the grief process. Part of it is, is the discomfort that we have as providers in terms of breaking bad news. There's the denial, there's conflict within families about whether we should do this or do that. There are differences among faith traditions and cultural traditions. There may or may not be advanced care planning that's gone on. There may or may not be an informed discussion about the lack of benefit of uh, feeding. And so this whole gamish is involved in this discussion. So it's not so simple that you can just walk in and say, boy, peg tubes don't work, end of discussion. This was an interesting uh, uh, summary. It was really kind of a reflective paper in which they summarized how family members responded to the idea of artificially hydrating their family members. This is part of the study that I talked to you about where patients were randomly assigned to either 100 or 1,000 mLs of normal saline. Hope comes through uh, loud and clear. We hope that hydration is what's causing the problem. Maybe my parents not really dying Maybe they're not really that sick, they just need some fluid 
maybe just a little bit more time. Okay? And the other one, we want them to be comfortable. Even if family members realize that their family member, their parent is dying, everyone agrees, well, do whatever it takes to keep mom comfortable. And this was the reasoning, uh, which sounds pretty logical, that one of the family members came up with. Well, we're made up of water. We've all learned that from grade school. And you have to keep hydrated. Water is a nutrient for the body. So, you know, th those are very common perceptions. So there's this vicious cycle that goes on. We're all familiar with it. Um, people are losing weight. They look terrible. Uh, everyone interprets weight loss as a sign of something awful happening for good reason. What's the first thing you think about when somebody walks through church or something and they've lost a lot of weight? Wow, I wonder what they've got. You know, that's the first instinct we all have. There's our response to it. There's conflicts about food. You know, one of the, one of the stories I see told time and time again in my office is as people lose their taste for food, interestingly, at least with many malignancies, it's the taste for cooked red meat. It smells bad, it tastes bad, it's not at all appetizing. Well, you're a, a salt of the earth farm family. Your husband suddenly is losing weight. He says nothing tastes good. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to make pot roast because that's his favorite meal. You're just asking for the worst disappointment in the world. He smells the pot roast cooking. He almost gets sick. They plop it down in front of him, telling him, well, this is your favorite meal. Surely you'll want to eat this. And they'll say, I can't, I can't eat this. And this entire conflict, it's like, well, if he won't eat his favorite meal, then all hope is lost. That is a very common scenario. And I think as you take care of patients and are aware of it, you'll be surprised how often you hear of that. This was another nice review uh, of a number of papers that looked at social uh, and emotional impacts on families. Uh, families tend to be more worried about the lack of appetite and hydration than patients do. They have a very high opinion of artificial hydration and nutrition. One of the important things to realize is because that's their perspective, when we say something like, no, it won't help, it won't work, what they hear is, you don't care. My parents suffering just because you won't give them fluids or food. And one of the problems is that we oftentimes, among ourselves, don't always present, if you will, a unified front in terms of what nutrition and hydration mean. I see it, it's just so instinctual. At the hospice house, if we have someone who eats a good meal, <laughs> you, you can't help but say, oh, wow, you ate your whole meal. Good for you. I'm, it's just impossible not to say it. Even scientifically, I understand that this isn't going to help the person at all. It's just how we respond to when people clean their plates, and that's just the way it is. I think one of the things that we can't escape as providers is we have a big influence, like many medical decisions. If you think of this as a medical treatment, people will listen to what we have to say if what we have to say has some scientific basis and basis and experience. So these are tough decisions. No one can question that. And I thought I would spend the rest of the time talking about some very practical things about how to help all of you carry on the conversations that we need to have. One of the things that I thought was very interesting is this phrase, comfort feeding only. And the definition is what you read. Comfort feeding only is through careful hand feeding. It's goal oriented. It's an alternative to tube feeding. And it eliminates the apparent message that we're sending of we don't care. We're not going to feed them artificially. That means we don't care. And so this group uh, suggested that an order 
in an institution, hospital or nursing home, calling for comfort feeding only would be a, a, a nice positive step. And I'll read you a little bit more. Uh, this comes from the paper, and I'll just read it to you. A new order, comfort feeding only, with the goal of providing a new language to reframe the discussions of managing eating problems in patients with dementia is proposed. Comfort in comfort feeding only has a twofold meaning. First, comfort refers to the stopping point in feeding, emphasizing that the patient will be fed so long as it's not distressing. And secondly, comfort refers to the goals of the feedings. The feedings are comfort-oriented in that they are the least invasive and potentially the most satisfying way of attempting to maintain nutrition through careful hand feeding. So that's the vision that this group has and I think has a lot of merit uh, to it. So uh, I think that's, that's worth uh, further thought and conversation. I think the other thing that's helpful is that um, these are medical terms, cachexia and orexia, and I thought I would just share with you suggestions from the literature in terms of how one might communicate those things to patients, and I think these are very helpful, and they're ones that I use myself. Cachexia, explain it to families, if you will, as a problem where the raw materials are present, but there's a defect in the factory in which the Furniture's not being produced. I've used that analogy and I think people have an easier time of understanding that this cachexia is more than just not getting enough food. I've tried to think of ways of explaining, as I understand it, my patients who say to us, myself and the family, I just can't eat anymore, I'm just not hungry. And the closest I think I've come, because I've gotten feedback, is that it's like all of us when we're asked to take that third helping at a Thanksgiving meal. That's how patients are feeling when the family is saying, you have to eat, Dad, you've got to eat. So I think that's a nice analogy because we can all relate to the uh, Thanksgiving example. And uh, I have used this one as well, which is feeding the tumor. There is actually some animal experimentation that it's true that uh, supplying additional fuel calories uh, may promote faster tumor growth and in studies that have been done it actually resulted in animal survival being reduced. This is a discussion uh, published by uh, uh, Dr. Delisser who's an ICU a physician of many years uh, in my society's journal Blood. He makes a couple points. You never want to say that we, we may withhold or withdraw treatments, but we never withdraw or withhold care. Sounds trite. I think it's a nice phrase to kind of tuck in the back and use that. That this whole issue of withdrawing or withholding isn't just a single act. It's sort of a process that you go through with a patient in the family. That, that too often, uh, discussions can center around what this means to the children or the spouse, and you have to redirect the family to say, what's, what's the benefit going to be for your father? What's the benefit going to be for your husband? I think this is one thing that we all have difficulty with, uh, is that is it takes time to have these discussions. There's no way to get around it. You want to make sure that everybody's there that needs to be there so no one feels left out and, frankly, you don't have to say it twice. And you should have at least some thought, some plan or options thought out when you meet with a family. It's not helpful for you to meet with a family and just think, well, the, the solution is going to bubble up because people are still going to ask you, what do you think we should do? And you should be ready with an answer for that. This is specifically about the meeting itself. And I'll just go through the structure. I've kind of highlighted what I think are very good teaching points. The introductions, obviously. Um, it's always good to not jump to the decision.
but to talk about what this means to the family members that are there to make the decision. It's very helpful to recast that patient that you're taking care of back into their role, which has been true for 99.9% .9 of their life, husband, provider, father. Let people think about what was important to them. It also gives us information that uh, we oftentimes don't get uh, unless we've taken care of someone for many, many years. Then you want to get down to brass tacks and just make sure that everybody's on the same page about what the facts are. That isn't always obvious, and sometimes these family meetings are very helpful just for that. Then you want to present your recommendations, the team's recommendations about how you think uh, things should proceed. It's also important to spend this time and tell people what's going to happen as this care is withdrawn or withheld. And then to spend additional time and talk about how people feel about that, to recognize that there may be anger, there's obviously sadness uh, that are part of that. And then uh, typically, uh, if you can, in this situation to end on a positive note, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Dr. Uh, uh, Delisser has these great examples, and I'll finish with these. The first is the statement that the family member makes. And then I'll just let you read what he suggests ought to be a response. And I think uh, in this form of ethical training or ethical discussion, these kinds of examples I think are helpful. And uh, I, I use them uh, in the reading that I do. He closes with, we'll do everything possible to make sure he's comfortable and does not suffer. But instead of the family saying, we want to do everything, and you going, well, I've done this and this, but I haven't, you know, I haven't measured a serum porcelain, and I haven't called, you know, the, you know, MD Anderson to see if there's anything available, you know. All of us, I think, get in the habit of saying, well, you know, it's impossible to do everything. And so, you know, we tend to fall back and, well, we could try this and this. I think we have to be clear to families. We've done everything that's reasonable. We've done everything that you can do. Fighting. My dad was a fighter. I thought this was really well stated. Not all fights are meant to be won. And that's just a reality. Have we done everything that we can for your father to make him successful in his fight? We have. I'm not ready to let my husband go, my father go, my mother go, my wife go. Um, and I thought, again, that he did a very nice job of framing that discussion. And again, th this seems very simple, but I think carrying these phrases in the back of your mind can be very helpful uh, when you're talking to families. Uh, this is where you kind of emphasize the positive, uh, as he suggested at the end of these meetings. And then, I believe in miracles. And uh, that's always a difficult one. But again, I think he gives a very reasoned, uh, empathetic answer to that. Assuming a miracle doesn't occur, are there other things you would like to hope for? Uh, a phrase that I've used before. Now, there are a number of guidelines that have been published. This isn't just uh, uh, a hit and miss paper uh, that with these ideas. The American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care Medicine, uh, and that is one of the handouts. It's the uh, longer of the handouts. And, and again, anyone that's interested is welcome to pick it up. It's a medical intervention. Like all medical interventions, it has to be evaluated in terms of risks and benefits. It's ethical and legal to withhold and withdraw artificial nutrition hydration. Open communication is the key, and the emphasis should always be on the patient. The Alzheimer's Association, in guidelines not very long ago, that it's ethical and legal to withhold and withdraw, that assisted oral feeding should be the standard. That's what should be available to all patients with advanced dementia not tube feeding, that the risk and benefits should be discussed before you place a feeding tube. 
and that this just reemphasizes the need for advanced planning and documentation. The European Society of Nutrition, the American Society of Parental and Natural Nutrition, and the German Association, that their bottom line is that parental nutrition should rarely be prescribed to patients with advanced cancer uh, receiving chemotherapy. And that's the only situation in which there is possibly some perceived benefit. The two handouts that are available to you in the back are, first of all, from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care or Medicine. And then the other is a very nice discussion from a, a website uh, called uh, Caring uh, Connections. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Take comments if people have comments or insights, anecdotes you'd like to share. Yeah, Mike. Larry, I remember about uh, six or seven years ago, there was a study in the New England Journal where they actually showed the percentage of people who were demented in nursing homes who got feeding tubes varied tremendously from state to state. In fact, in one state, I think it was Mississippi and, the, and also in the District of Columbia, 90% of demented patients had feeding gastrotomies and it was in the single digits in some of the Midwestern states. Is there still that huge degree of variation? Even though, Mike, even though that paper is fairly old, I think that's still the most recent information I know of. And everyone makes that point. Of course, every provider, every uh, payer, not a provider, every payer of any procedure always likes to go to geographic disparity and say, you know, why is there that much disparity? But it is striking. It is certainly striking, and it's a good point. Questions and comments? If not, thank you very much. <laughs>